Hello there, everyone. Time to get excited. Time to celebrate. Time for another edition of HL Chemistry Flip Classroom. Thanks for being here. You know, I really like this guy's moves. I think I'm going to add it to my uh, repertoire of, um, you know, excited motions that I have. Uh, add that to my bag of tricks. Anyway, let's get started here, guys. We're going to talk about kinetic molecular theory today, KMT, and a little bit about phase changes. Um, KMT is kind of a grouping of ideas. It's some kind of, I would say, common sense stuff. But we're going to talk about the tenets or the things, the um, keys to kinetic molecular theory, some of the key points. A lot of the stuff is stuff you've heard about in other science classes and, and is kind of common sense type stuff. But let's go ahead and just make sure we kind of understand the following things. Um, we're going to, one thing that kinetic mo molecular theory says is that particles are in constant random motion unless that's at absolute zero. But gas particles are going to be the farthest apart. Uh, liquid particles are going to be closer together. They're going to have more attraction to each other. Think back when we talked about um, intermolecular forces and stuff and the bonding unit and kind of tied it into that. And then solids, the particles of the solid are going to very, be very close together. They're going to have the most attraction for each other, and they're going to have the least freedom of movement. And if for some reason this is not clear, I have a diagram in the next slide that might help. Um, another thing that kinetic molecular theory says is that when a substance is heated, it's going to gain kinetic energy and the particles in that thing are going to start moving faster and become more chaotic in their motion, more random. Um, we're definitely going to talk, uh, when we go to, to the energetics unit, we're going to talk about temperature and, and um, heat energy and kind of differences between those, but, but what temperature is, it's a measurement and it is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the particles in the thing that you're taking the temperature of. And we'll talk more about that as this video goes on. So here's a little diagram, a uh, GIF or GIF, I don't know what side of the argument you fall on there, of um, a solid, liquid, or gas, and just hopefully you're visualizing this. Solid particles do move a little bit, but they're locked into place, or they're just sort of wiggling around. Liquid particles are still relatively close together. They can tumble over each other. And then we have the gas particles, which are basically zipping around um, all over the place. And when I'm saying review, uh, as we talked about, basically the stronger the intermolecular forces, the more likely something is to be a solid at room temperature as opposed to a liquid or a gas. Gas particles have very little intermolecular force between them. Um, well, well, anyway, we'll, we'll also develop that idea more. But um, hopefully you're thinking about solid liquids and gases correctly in terms of um, how, they, how they look at the particle level. So... Um, Something I want to talk about is endothermic versus exothermic. This, again, is going to be kind of a theme of the year, things we're going to talk about in several points. But endothermic, thermic, of course, means like heat energy. So endothermic would mean energy in. So energy is going into the thing that you're talking about, and it's absorbing energy. An example of something you might be familiar with that is an endothermic process is um, an instant cold pack, like one of those things that you break it and it gets, it gets cold. Not like an ice pack that's frozen, but something that you break it and there's a chemical reaction that makes it gets cold. Um, that's endothermic. It's absorbing energy from the outside world, including your fingers if you touch it, so it feels cold. Um, exothermic processes release heat energy, so energy goes from the thing you're talking about into the outside world. And um, so fire is an example of an exothermic process. Now, what we're going to do right now is tie these into phase changes. So before I go to this next slide, what I'd like you to think about is the phase change of evaporation going from a liquid to a gas. Do you think that is an endothermic process or an exothermic process? Okay, so um, here we have uh, a kind of a phase change tri triangle, and um, you definitely need to know these phase changes, and you need to know if they are endothermic or exothermic phase changes. Um, these four over here are probably familiar to you, maybe these not as much. But in um, answer to our question here, um, sublimation, evaporation, and melting are endothermic processes. So evaporation is endothermic. Now if that um, weirds you out in any way, evaporation is a process that is cooling and it does feel cold, if you, especially if you think about this scenario. Imagine it's May, early May, you maybe go swimming a little bit earlier than you should, you get out of the pool, a breeze blows, that water evaporates across your skin. How does that feel? It, it does not feel warm, does it? Uh, in fact, that's the whole point of swimming and the whole point of sweating is that you're getting 
water on your skin, it's evaporating off your skin, and it's quite literally pulling heat energy from your body, and you are cooling down in that sense. And that's why we go swimming, that's why we sweat, is to take advantage of the um, endothermic nature of evaporation. Um, so anyway, um, again, melting, it, it, uh, going from solid to liquid, and solidification going from liquid to solid. You can call that freezing as well, that's the same thing. Um, liquid to gas is evaporation. Condensation is gas to liquid. Um, again, the ones we may be less familiar with are sublimation. That's a solid going directly to a gas. I'll give you two examples of when that happens. Um, one would be uh, like, a, like an air freshener, you know, one of those solid air fresheners. Um, you kind of open it up. It's solid. It's going directly to a gas, and then those gas particles are drifting across, and they're entering your nose, and that's how you smell this air freshener. It's kind of a disturbing thought. I don't know if you've ever pondered it, but if you smell something, little pieces and parts of it do have to enter your nose. Uh, and if you think about it, that has to be true. It's not magic. Um, it can be kind of gross in certain situations if you think about that. But anyway, I digress. Uh, sublimation is solid uh, directly with gas. Oh, another, another situation is um, dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide. It, uh, it goes right from the solid state to the gas state. Um, that's the stuff, you know, like in Halloween, you put it in punch bowls and it makes that mist or whatever if you're not familiar with it. But hey, folks, that's why they call it dry ice. It's not wet ice like normal water ice, which gets wet, goes from solid to liquid, and then maybe evaporates. It goes, it goes, dry ice goes directly to a gas. That's why they call it dry ice. Um, deposition is the opposite, going from a solid to, uh, rather, from, rather from a gas directly to a solid. Um, deposition occurs when there's like frost on your windshield in the morning of your car. Um, normally, that's because uh, water vapor in the, in the air has directly deposited as a solid in the windshield. Um, so, know these. What you might want to do is draw this little thing and have some way of labeling the endothermic and exothermic ones. Um, basically, all of the ones where the particles have to have to speed up uh, and kind of gain more energy. They have to get farther apart. They have to start moving more chaotically. Those are all the endothermic ones. So melting, you got to you got to break down those particles in the solid, make it a liquid. Um, evaporation, you got to completely separate the particles, make it into a gas. And then also for solid to gas, you got to totally separate those particles, getting them moving more crazy. Those are all the endothermic ones. And then all the exothermic ones are just the opposite. Condensation, solidification, deposition. So know the names of all these phase changes and also know whether they are endothermic or exothermic. Um, this thing, uh, the, the, the <clears throat> really all you need to know about this, I don't know that you necessarily need to sketch out this whole thing or anything like that, but if you're not aware of it, I need you to be aware that during phase changes the temperature of things um, do not change typically. So like if we had water here, and, and as in the ice solid form, while it's melting, it would stay at zero degrees Celsius until all the ice melted, and then it would turn into a liquid, and then it would start boiling. Again, what's um, important to recognize here is that when water is boiling, uh, it will stay at a constant temperature. It doesn't matter how high you turn up the heat or whatever, you can't get it any hotter. You can't get a liquid any hotter than its boiling point without doing some weird stuff or having some weird equipment. But in normal circumstances, you can't do that. Um, so that's probably the most important thing to take home here, is that we we can't get a liquid any hotter than its boiling point. It'll just turn to a gas instead of its instead of its temperature changing. Um, it would be possible to heat a gas up as hot as you want. At some point, maybe I have or maybe I will show you a demonstration related to that. Um, but we'll save that for another day. Okay, now you don't need to write this down. Let's just talk a little bit about this idea of a bell curve. You've probably heard about it before, um, but. It, many things, including like the height of people, if you measured the height of a bunch of people um, and you plotted it on a graph, you would get a curve like this. Like let's say we, you know, we took everyone in Aurora and we, we measured their height, and uh, so this is the number of people, this is their height. Most people are going to be of some average height. There's going to be a few very tall people and a few very short people. And there are many things that would get data like this. Height, um, you know, thumb length, um, weight even probably, uh, uh, tree size, I don't know. There would just be a bunch of things that we could plot like this that would produce a bell curve. Income, um, it, it, things like that. Um, now, another thing I would point about this graph is, you know, imagine, you know, imagine you, you talked to 200 people and you plotted their height. 
you know so this is like one person over here maybe this is also one person this is like three people and etc and so forth this is 35 people right here or whatever um, if you added up all of those things like here's my point for one person here's my point for one person here's two you know here's five whatever that if you added up all of your number of people that you plotted along this line that would be the total number of people that you that you sampled right so in a curve like this the area under the curve if we could find like the area that's under this thing mathematically that would be the total number of people so that's going to be important for something we're going to talk about in a second um but yeah you know people come in extremes different sizes got the uh tallest dude on the basketball team here um always fun to compare um Shaq and uh, Kevin Hart there very interesting discrepancy in their heights but you know so we have people on these extreme ends we have everyone in between and so we get a bell curve basically um, okay so this is the part that you should write down and that we should know there's a thing called the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution so what you're doing with the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution and you see one here is you're looking typically at a sample of a gas and um, all the different gas molecules and remember I said before temperature is a measure of kinetic energy but um, in a sample of gas or really anything but in particular here we're talking about a gas not all the particles are going to have the same kinetic energy some are going to have a lot of kinetic energy like Shaq some are going to have a lesser kinetic energy like Kevin Hart and most of them are going to have some average kinetic energy so kinetic energy of of molecules in a gas are going to be uh, in a bell curve type situation and in and we're specifically talking about this it's called the Maxwell Boltzmann, Boltzmann distribution and you should definitely know what they look like I would sketch this here you should know their general shape you might have to draw one at different times and so forth so um, here's an example um, We've got three curves here to the right. Now what you're looking at here is you've got number of molecules, you've got kinetic energy. Um, this is the same sample of gas. Imagine we, we looked at the number of molecules versus the kinetic energy for a sample of gas at three different temperatures. And as I said, um, the area under the curve is gonna be the total number of molecules in this case, just like in our other one, it was the total number of people. So we have three different ones. Again, the same sample of gas at three different temperatures. What I'd like you to think about before I advance the next, the next slide is which one of these samples, is it the blue one, the red one, or the green one here, which one of these samples would represent the gas at the highest temperature? I'll let you think about that for a second. So, okay, now I asked which one of these is at the highest temperature, so let's take a look. Remember that temperature, two things to think about here, temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy and also average is going to be the point that's right at the top of the bell curve. So the one with the highest temperature is going to be the one where the top or the peak of the bell curve is shifted farthest to the right. So it's going to be the green one. The green one is the one at the highest temperature. Um, this would actually be at the lowest temperature. It's very tempting. What some people want to do is they see the blue one, it's just the highest up, they just want to pick the blue one. But it's actually going to be the green one. Now let's talk about why um, the shape of this changes. Remember what I said, this is the same sample of gas at different temperatures. So therefore the number of molecules is remaining constant at these three different temperatures. And so the area under the curve has to remain constant at these three different temperatures. Um, because the area under the curve is the number of molecules. So Another thing I mentioned is that at higher temperatures, these things start moving and they get more chaotic. So at the higher temperature, since there's more kind of a more chaotic nature to the data, it's going to spread out the bell curve, kind of make more extremes. So if the area under the curve has to remain the same, and if I spread out the edges, that means the top has to drop. So that's why it's getting lower as we go down, because the area has to remain constant, and if I spread it out, it has to be, it has to be lower down. So that's why at the higher temperature, it shifts to the right and also it spreads out and drops. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, that can be a little bit mind-blowing for some people, but um, you know, if you have any questions, make sure to ask me in class because we are done with this video, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll catch you next time.